Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Sumila Guliani. I'm from the World Bank. Uh, I'm a manager for urban development and water supply for Europe and Central Asia. And it is my pleasure and honor to be here today as your moderator for this session on strategic planning. Uh, I'm sorry for the delay in starting. We were waiting for uh, Mr. Marat Husnulin from the city of Moscow, who is at lunch with the mayor. But since we are already running late, I think we'll get started with the other speakers, and Mr. Marat will join us shortly. Um, so I'll take a moment to introduce uh, the panelists. Uh, uh, right here, on the first person is uh, Mr. Andrew Altman. Uh, he is a visiting fellow at the London School of Economics. He's the founding uh, chief executive of the London Olympic Legacy Park. Uh, before that, he has been the de uh, deputy mayor in Philadelphia, and prior to that, chief planner for Washington, D.C., the city where I live, and we see the ev evidence of his work every day. It's really extraordinary work. Uh, right next to him is Mr. Rashid uh, Sadat, who is the head of the Huateng uh, Planning Commission uh, in Johannesburg in South Africa. Huateng is the large province within which Johannesburg is um, located, and he is the architect of their new plan for 2055, and therefore an excellent person to be on this panel on strategic planning. To my left is Greg Clark, who many of you saw this morning as the moderator for the first plenary session. Uh, there are not too many, one falls short of words in describing uh, Greg. He is a uh, expert on cities, he's an author, he's an advisor to many a mayor and many governments. He's done a lot of research, he has moderated, uh, I would say by now, hundreds of uh, conferences like this and participated in them. He's an author of six books and a new forthcoming book on strategic planning. And again, it is our real honor to have him on this panel today. Um, we also have another panelist who hasn't showed up, so when he does, uh, I'll introduce uh, him at that time. Excellent. So I think uh, with that, let me hand over the floor to uh, uh, Andy uh, Altman. Uh, he has about 10 minutes to make a presentation. Uh, it's going to be tight because he has lots of um, experience to share, but without further ado, let me hand it over to him. Welcome, Andy. Okay, great, okay. Um, it's a little hard to see it from here, but that's all right. Um, but thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I will speak uh, quickly, even quickly for an, uh, someone from the uh, United States. I'll uh, go even uh, quicker than usual. Um, I, um, the main point I want to make today is to talk about the London Olympics uh, of 2012 which was in East London and was the redevelopment of a 600 acre site. And to put that in the context of strategic planning, because unlike many other cities in the past that have had Olympics uh, events where it's been about the games first and then justify legacy or try to do planning afterwards, the London Olympics, uh, very much as you heard this morning from Sir Edward Lister, the deputy mayor in London, was actually the result of over 30 to 40 years of strategic planning and a vision for the city. So I'm gonna very quickly talk about that and then some of the key lessons. Uh, this is London, and I think the key point, is, as Edward Listard said, is that London is growing, growing more than it thought it would. It's over eight million, actually this number is wrong, 8.4 million people projected to go to 10 million people. So it's a city very much growing. And where would it grow? It's constrained by the green belt, as you can see, uh, which was established in 1947. It's a city that was very much a horizontal city, very much not a vertical city, but a very low density city. This, as you can see, uh, is the uh, extent of where the green belt uh, ends in London. Uh, this shows the density of London relative to other major cities around the world. And as you can see, it's a very horizontal city, very much as villages connected by transport. So the challenge then is, 
how do you take a city that is over 50% lower rise and accommodate that growth within a green belt uh, and within the kind of environment and uh, urban form that London, that makes London very unique. And as I said, London would go to over 10 million people. What you see in the London plan is that that growth really goes along the east-west, along the River Thames, along the Thames River. And whether that's employment growth, housing growth, or this called areas of regeneration, meaning the older industrial areas of the city, or areas that where greater uh, uh, utilization of land could occur, and also the poorer areas of the city, occurs, as you could see, in that swath of land. And that's exactly where the Olympics is located, in East London. And as London looks to grow, much of that growth is looking east, here from the city, uh, toward uh, the Olympic site. And this is a process that has been going on, as I say, for over 40 uh, years. And you can see this is East London looking from the city out uh, toward that area. This started in the 1970s with the change in shipping and containerization and deindustrialization, a classic condition of all major industrial cities that left vast areas of docks and industrial lands suddenly obsolete, areas that were poorer and the heart of industry. And so starting in the 80s with Margaret Thatcher and the beginning of Canary Wharf was the beginning of the move east of London to create a financial center to compete uh, globally and to anchor London's position as the leading economic center, financial center uh, at that time. Very worried at the time about competition with Frankfurt. Now what you can see is a 20 year process that created Canary Wharf, today a major financial uh, center. At the time this was treated with much skepticism. People in the city, the current financial district, thought that that would never happen. It was too far away from London. Today, it's literally considered the center of London. So this notion of center and periphery is always changing. This geography, and particularly the cognitive map, how you think about the city, is always changing. So that's the 80s to the 90s. At the national level, major emphasis, this is under former Prime Minister Blair, Lord Richard Rogers, uh, Ricky Burdett, who's here today, many others, produced cities, uh, policy for cities that said, develop on brownfield sites, develop compact urban form, mixed use matters, and again, emphasis on East London. And come 2000 and the millennium, they decide that the next project, again, always kind of link ideas of planning with a concrete project, Canary Wharf, in this case, the Millennium Dome, which is uh, over there, see the dome at the end, was another movement east. You can see Canary Wharf. Wasn't successful at first, took time, and now very successful that dome is one of the most popular uh, attractions in London. The third piece was the Olympics. And we now have Canary Wharf, Millennium Dome, and the idea of a newly elected mayor, Ken Livingstone, who was the first elected in mayor in a very, very long time in London, how to continue that move eastward. And the Olympics was the vehicle to continue that infrastructure investment east. As you can see, it's that movement east from the city, Canary Wharf, and you see the circle at the top is the Olympic Park. And the idea was how do we create something that we can get enough political consensus and capital to continue the creation of new centers in London outside of the center to accommodate its growth to be competitive in the global economy. Centered on transport was critical. There was a transport infrastructure, but could not unlock the land. Importantly, is also an area of huge social deprivation. This shows that with each move, with each stop of the tube going toward East London, will you lose a year of life expectancy. So it shows the depth of poverty in red. And the idea was to use the Olympics to both facilitate growth, but also to create opportunity for areas, uh, for the poorer areas, most poorest areas of the United Kingdom. This is the site that they discovered, uh, that they selected, that's sitting on Tropic Transport, but as I said, could not unlock it as a future regeneration site to create a new center. You can imagine when the BBC and the media went out and they said, we are going to go for the games, and they won the games. Paris was supposed to win, but, Bar but uh, thought was to win, but London did. Jubilation, they go to the site, and they say, oh my gosh, how is that going to happen? Completely derelict site. Um, sorry, it's a little slow. 
uh, but shows you what it was like. Obsolete infrastructure, all privately owned land largely, and had to put all of this site together uh, to create a new opportunity for regeneration. It's a lot of social housing, but also very vibrant immigrant communities, vibrant neighborhoods with small businesses and artists. So how do you get that mix right of new regeneration and connecting existing communities to the opportunity? And that was the challenge of the Olympics. This was the site in 2005. This is the game site. And that's the vision for the future when the site becomes a piece of the city. Literally, not a site that's about sports venues, but a site that is a new uh, uh, center for London to accommodate its future. Um, I think my time is running short. How much, do I have two minutes? One minute? It's, up. it's up. Let me show something that's important, uh, two slides, and I won't go through the rest. One was the context of the Olympics, is that it occurred within a context of strong regional and spatial planning. It started 40 years ago with a clear vision to move east. That vision transcended political uh, jurisdiction, you know, politics, different prime ministers, different parties, and two different mayors. Ken Livingstone, Labour, and now Boris Johnson, uh, Conservative, Tory, who have kept that vision. So being true to the vision is absolutely critical for large-scale metropolitan planning and the creation of new centers happen. You can't start and stop. Secondly is the planning for the Olympic Park itself. In, this shows you from left to right, but you actually lead it from right to left. The planning for the site occurred not how do we do the site first for the Olympics and figure out how it, what it'll be later in legacy, but actually started from legacy on the right. What does this piece of city going to look like and how do the games fit into that? That was key. I'll end on this because there are many other slides I won't be able to show. These are kind of five key points of this, which were one, having a very strong vision when you're going out and thinking about developing new centers, new centers of, of the city that has to fit into that vision. Two, uh, strategic infrastructure, critical in the case of the Olympic Park. That was transport infrastructure and unlocking the land. Third is how you organize that land, uh, so strategically use it to capture value because the government, the public, is investing a lot of money, as in the Olympics, it was six billion pounds. How do they capture that over time? So not selling land too quickly, getting rid of land too quickly, but using it strategically uh, over time. And at the end, I think importantly, and I'm going to skip to right to the end and end here, is that what London did, and these are just images of the park so you get a feel for it, was this, and I'll end on this, which London set up an institutional structure, a framework, to translate the vision for creating a new center that could then go for the next 20 to 30 years and set up a London Legacy Development Corporation that within that boundary had planning power, owned the public land, and also was a steward of the public space because a new 200-acre park was created that had to be cared for, created value, but also created a great opportunity for the social mixing of the area. It makes sure that there will be a diverse community, 35% of the housing will be affordable, and connects people to jobs. So a very strong facilitative role. The important point is connecting vision to action, 30, 40 years, um, of sticking to that vision and setting up the right institutional structures to make sure that that vision is maintained and can transcend the vicissitudes of the market, ups and downs of different political cycles, so that that vision uh, is strong and ultimately makes your city uh, more competitive. Thank you. Thank you, Andy, for trying to compress so much information and such a long experience in so few minutes. Uh, let me uh, take a minute to uh, introduce uh, Mr. Murat, um, sorry, Marat Husnulin, the Dep Deputy Mayor for Urban Development and Construction for, for, for Moscow City. Please welcome uh, Mr. Marat. Thank you. Um, so just uh, to summarize um, Andy's points, uh, it's very interesting that he laid out over a 30-year period a move towards East London. And unlike today's, today morning's plenary session where everybody said that transport is key to 
achieving a vision, I think Andy pre presented a counterpoint where transport was critical, but it was not sufficient in itself to deliver on regeneration of existing blighted areas on the east of London, and it required a concerted planning uh, effort to, do so, uh, to uh, leverage the transport and deliver the regeneration. With that, let me welcome Mr. Rashid, uh, who will present to us experience from uh, South Africa. Welcome, Rashid. Um, Hello. I think uh, this will be a little better because I can at least see the screen. Uh, actually, I can see the screen from here. So, um, okay. Um, what I'm going to do is, is very quickly to look at uh, what are some of the key insights, issues, and tensions uh, that we had to navigate uh, in South Africa when we did the Gauteng Vision 2055, and that's the vision of the Gauteng Provincial Government, which I'll explain. Um, uh, just as a point of information, that's, that's South Africa, that's where we're at. Uh, we're bound by two oceans, um, and, and the red ring that you see in the center is basically the, the Gauteng province, and, and I'll come to that in a moment. But just to cover the, the basics of the country, 50, 52 million people, uh, I think most people know that Nelson Mandela was elected president in 1994. We have a unitary system of government after a long struggle against apartheid. We have nine provinces, of which Gauteng is one in over 200 municipalities. It's the largest economy in Africa, uh, fairly diversified across primary, secondary, and tertiary industries, uh, and it's classed as an upper middle income country uh, and a member of BRICS, uh, which, which I think is a significant point. Um, and the, the kind of, uh, but, but of course, th that's on the positive side. Uh, when our government did, did a whole lot of work, uh, there, there was a big kind of focus on, on what are the challenges that we still face 20 years after democracy, and it's centered around this issue of, of poverty and inequality, um, unemployment, problems of, of crumbling infrastructure, poor public service, high disease burden, etc. Um, oops, sorry. Um, and uh, on the 11th of November last year, the, the government launched uh, the, the National Development Plan, which is the, the uh, core Vision 2030. And the key elements of that plan are obviously a focus and centered on this idea of long-term prosperity and equity um, uh, on the basis of, of, of a number of pillars that you see around, including job creation, expansion of infrastructure, uh, the, the, the judicious use of, of, uh, of resources, inclusive planning, quality education, healthcare, building a capable state, fighting corruption, and uniting the nation. Um, and, and now we zoom in into Gauteng, uh, this is what it looks like. That's a province uh, you know, for, for which I, I'm, I'm the chief planner. Um, in the center is, is the city of Johannesburg, just to kind of orient you. That's the largest city of about 400, uh, four, four and a half million people. But it's part of a contiguous urban co conurbation. And Tswani to the north, also known as Pretoria, is our capital, 60 kilometers north of Johannesburg. And then immediately to the east is, is the industrial belt of Ekuruleni. So those three sort of components are the, uh, where about 8 million people live, and, 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 the, and basically the rest live, live, live in the rest of the province. Um, it's, uh, I'm not going to go through this, but, but, but this is what we're famous for, including gold. And, and, but I think significantly it's the kind of the, the area with the highest levels uh, of, 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 of GDP in the, in the country. Um, we, we also uh, ba basically had a, a number of, of challenges, and they include uh, high levels of migration, poverty and unemployment that I mentioned, community fragmentation, dislocation, the, uh, a spatial structure which is based on the apartheid legacy, unsustainable use of resources, and, and problematic governance arrangements. We have been working on something called Gauteng 2055, which is, which is our long-term vision. And, and we're saying to people, don't take it literally. It's not, really a, I mean, a sort of a plan which takes a year in, year out to 2055. But it's basically about generational change. It's there for some symbolic kind of historical reasons why we're calling it 2055. But it's about the next generation. Um, and, and this, in, in, in many ways, summarizes it. So, I mean, these are the, the, the sort of core components. It's based on four pillars. Uh, on sustainable development, equitable growth, because we've had a problem in the past of growth without sort of equity and, and growing levels of inequality. 
good governance. I mean, on the on the platform of, of our long term, uh, of of the kind of where we come from, as well as social inclusivity and and and, and introduce and uh, poverty reduction. But I just want to talk through very quickly uh, in the five minutes that I have left is just some of the, the lessons that we learned. And, and I think uh, one of the kind of take homes that we've learned over the last two years in relation to this process. The first is that obviously we work in an intergovernmental system. So I mean, and there's always this tension about, you know, where do you look locate yourself, and we're basically saying that since we have a national plan, um, it has a lot of uh, coherence and fairly integrated, although there's been quite a, a vigorous discourse around the, around the national plan, we, we're arguing that actually uh, it, it, it basically has, has the, the, the kind of the, uh, gives us a sense about where we're taking uh, the country to the future, and, and, and that I think uh, on the basis of a fair amount of consensus is, is where we should be going. The second insight is that although we have a national plan, it's really important to have a sub-national plan or sub-national plans, if you like. Um, and, 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 and this is also a, a debate that we, we have quite often. We say we have, you have a national plan, why are you having a, a, a provincial plan? But we argue that you need to take account of the specificity or the particularities that exist in, in, in our part of the world, and, and, and that is what we have to then begin to, 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 to sharpen. The third issue is, uh, I, I guess, one which is similar to, to, to Moscow in many ways, uh, being a sort of primate city, if you like, um, and in, in a sort of hierarchy of cities or, 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 or urban centers, certainly the Gauteng city region, as we sometimes call it, is basically the sits at the apex of the urban system. And what does that mean? I mean, similar to, I, I know London, I mean, uh, the UK government has got a London plan. And in South Africa, we, we struggle with this issue about uh, kind of uh, the, 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 you know, the, the, the spectrum of, of, um, of towns and cities that, that exist. And, and, and there's a belief that, that they all have kind of equal weight. And we, we're basically trying to, to make the argument very strongly that you have to invest in, in, the, in the primary city that actually generates the largest amount of, 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 uh, of income and resources for the country as a whole. Um, and, and that's a, a sort of key thing that we need to, to look at. The other issue is that we, I mean, there's this huge debate that we uh, face when doing long-term planning uh, about this idea of, you know, do you have trade-offs and, and do you only kind of look at things in, in, a, fa in a fairly narrow way? Uh, the argument that we've made is that we need to cover all the bases. So if you look at my previous slide, the one with the, the kind of picture slide, what we're really arguing is that you have to cover all the, the, the critical bases. In other words, you must make sure that you're simultaneously dealing with economic growth as you are with su sustainable development because they're actually in interconnected. So we don't want to carry on the trajectory of the economy that we've had in the past, which is a re resource intensive economy, uh, and, and, and that creates problems for us. Uh, similarly, issues around um, equitable growth and, 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 um, and uh, social inclu inclusivity. I mean, the, the relationship between inequality and, and ensuring that uh, you, you address issues of poverty are, are actually sort of very closely related. So that's really the kind of point that we, we want to, to make uh, in that regard. Um, the, 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 the next one is really that we have to think about planning in, in a fairly integrated way. Again, it's, uh, and I've argued uh, for a long time that I think this idea of in integrated planning can very much be a sort of, uh, the, you know, looking for the holy grail. I mean, you're always close to it, but you never quite find it. And, but I think we need to, to forge that kind of planning is, is really important. I know in the UK, in the past, we call it joined up government and all sorts of things. I know it's still a current thing great, but uh, it's certainly something that we, we I think, have been struggling with in the last 20 years, um, you know, even though the constitutional basis for that is there, uh, certainly the, the practice uh, you know, hasn't, uh, hasn't come together. And of course, there, there are many constraints to it. And, I, and I've listed some of them, but, 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 but in a way, I think we have to address some of those, the, the, those particular constraints to ensure that we, we achieve them. Then the final point around, uh, around the, the thinking or, or the kind of insights that we, we gain in relation to, to doing our long-term plan is that, of course, we have to balance competing interests. And, and I think that's quite a critical issue. And, and how do you, you know, it's, you, you, you have to, to make sure that 
uh, the interests of developers versus the interests of environmentalists versus uh, slum dwellers, whatever. I think all of all of those considerations need to be taken into account so that you, you basically come to some kind of balance. And and of course, it, it does mean that you, you you're going to uh, impact on on, on on sometimes on, on particular uh, groups, but but I think you need to do that consciously, and that is related to the point of leadership that, that the political leadership uh, needs to ensure that, that those uh, you know, interests are, are effectively balanced on the basis of, of, of the kind of electoral mandates that you have out there. So, so those are just uh, uh, very briefly uh, some of the key points that, you know, that we thought uh, one could extract from, from our particular experience. Uh, and of course, it'll be interesting to hear what, what other people say as well as the audience. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Rashid. Thank you, Rashid, for uh, staying right on time. We really appreciate it. Uh, it was already a fairly summarized presentation. We made six points, but I think I was personally really struck by a few of them that uh, stand out. Should you focus on a few issues, or should you go simultaneously after several of them? And his argument is. Uh, don't go for economic development alone, go for inclusive eco economic development. So the point being that uh, the idea that you can just go with one pillar and wait to do the other pillars at another time doesn't work for them. It may work for other countries, but I thought that was a very interesting point, and there were several others, uh, and I'm sure we can raise them in question and answer session. Uh, please join me now welcoming Mr. M Marat Husnulin. Uh, are actually our host here in Moscow. Uh, welcome, sir, and we look forward to your presentation. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We hold the third time the Moscow Urban Forum, and I should say that this event uh, is very useful for development of city development and uh, is very useful in terms of obtaining information and, and making management decisions. I'd like to say what has been done in the city for the last three years and what key factors influence um, urban planning in Moscow. I'll start that historically we have some issues and problems that are key problems when decision making. First problem is disbalance of uh, place of living and, and place of work, which makes transportation situation worse. Every day, um, 1.5 million people come to work to the center of Moscow. Uh, another serious problem is a very high density of population and, and at the same time, uh, insufficient transport infrastructure. These slides show that Density is very high, and uh, in density in uh, all city limits, we have more than 10,000 per one hec hectare compared to Hong Kong. But in terms of length of um, roads, uh, we are two, three times lagging behind on any uh, mega city in the world. Uh, so when making decisions for a new urban development in Moscow, we were based on, on, on this uh, problems and um, took them into account when making urban planning develop decision. We, now we're preparing a new master plan that we plan to uh, approve finally in 2015. We adjust the old master plan and correct new territories that joined Moscow one and a half years ago. And, and which factors are we are based on? First of all is uh, advantage of human potential. And Moscow has 100% population has uh, high education and um, and the highest share of people with a, with a higher education compared to many mega mega cities of the world. Well, so with city development, we put a task to develop and create this works work jobs that has the highest added value. So we don't plan to build new plants and we plan to build new offices, financial institutions and, and uh, facilitate development of health care, education and tourism. So another serious factor of Moscow that's uh, advantage territorial um, 
sp uh, territorial potential as uh, like all roads uh, come to Rome and uh, all transportation routes in, in, in this in the country they come to Moscow all railroads all major auto roads 80 percent of, of uh, air aircraft also carriers come to Moscow transport hub so we have to take into account is as main in a development of Moscow agglomeration. So next factor that I'd like to draw attention that economic advantages. So now on the territory of Moscow from 25% of, of GDP and we have the highest level of incomes of population and uh, strange as it may seem with all our transport problems the largest concentration of capital, financial capital in Moscow. 80% of all banking capital in in the country are located in Moscow. And, and the largest uh, amount of uh, dollar billionaires live in Moscow. That's why we put a task to create international financial center. That's a comprehensive government program that we uh, systemically deal with the federal government and it includes many aspects. We develop new points of economic growth and these points of economic growth should be related with our neighbors, uh, Moscow region and central federal. Um, until we were able for the last two years uh, find full understanding in development plans of Moscow and Moscow region. Decisions are, making, are taken at the federal level that there will be one law for development of Moscow, Moscow region. Now we took the basis of polycentric development and our objective for this 1.5 million uh, working uh, people coming to work to center to create jobs in the periphery and on the map see a new territory of Moscow that appeared 1.5 years ago in area is 2.5 times bigger than exists in Moscow and we plan to create 1 million jobs here and, and 1.5 million uh, living and 12 points of growth so by results of this year more than 30,000 jobs were created on this territory and we actually continue to develop this territory and, and uh, building transportation carcass and only 150,000 uh, cubic meters of square meters of real estate uh, built on this. We use uh, existing resource of in, in industrial zones in Moscow. You see in the map black spots uh, shown the zones, uh, industrial zones, and, and we are happy that all transportation roads, including uh, first of all, railroads and territories were not uh, built, and and uh, with uh, that's a big factor that we develop this pedestrian uh, access and and focus on uh, development on most railroads. That's a uh, uh, radial uh, air, uh, direction of railroad, and we plan to build new stations of um, metro and subway, and we. Planet to depressive uh, areas. Having understood that these areas will start active development after a, me a metro. Another factor is liquidation, disbalance of territory development. Now, historically, it turned out that within existing Moscow, we have new centers of development. They 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 were created chaotically. Like for example, we created the city, Moscow city, around city, and it's an territory of 30 hectares, so 4.5 million. Uh, square meters of buildings and, and so on. The city had become a new center and the whole territory around it started to develop very actively. So we plan to use existing territory, industrial zones, and I can say for the last year, only industrial zones started construction of 4 million uh, square meters of real estate, that's housing, offices, workstations, uh, infrastructure. We have serious disbalance for some territories of the city in terms of social infrastructure. Now, now we have kindergartens and schools somewhere um, underloaded and, and uh, or not somewhere where active had a shortage of kindergartens. And for the last two years, we built more than 100 kindergartens and, and, and built 10, 10 schools and, and new sports facilities. So we also have big work on to develop the 
uh, public spaces and uh, uh, tasks to make the city convenient for living and several program includes some um, uh, improvement is uh, pedestrian access, uh, bike uh, lanes, and uh, improvement of yards, and as a separate program to to improve quality level of life of uh, Moscow. So main issue for urban development of the city and main factor is uh, existing uh, transportation system. Uh, first of all, what we plan to build, and now have in terms of length of uh, subways, we had three twenty four. Uh, kilometers. Um, it's one of the highest in uh, in the world. As uh, only in the the subways, uh, what is underground and uh, highest in the world. And we plan to build in the next eight years another 160 kilometers. And this program has been described, approved. On the map, you can see as uh, half of this scope is already construction underway. Another uh, important task to develop existing railroads and. Um, Happily, that the availability of these railroads, on the one hand, they they cut uh, the city in different sectors. On the other hand, they give the opportunity, and there is a transportation corridors to develop and and uh, along the railroads will be a new city development. And uh, so many territories adjacent and in the in the pedestrian and walking distance and the railroad is 10 percent of the city territory. So if we develop this 10 percent of the city, the city will be developing differently. We have developed a program of road construction. Even previous years, we built about 20 kilometers per year. Then by results of this year, we already built 72 kilometers. And by the end of the year, it will be about 80. And 15 artificial facilities like uh, bridges and, and uh, viaducts. And uh, we have uh, this program. And so we built roads, first of all, for development of public transportation. We built more than 200 kilometers of, of separate lines for auto roads. We understand we cannot satisfy all our, all demands for uh, automobiles. Uh, uh, we at least uh, enable um, buses and trams to go along without impediments. We have large work on, on transportation transfer um, hubs, and we had these transit hubs that has daily 300,000 traffic um, passenger, uh, uh, um, passengers, and especially develop, we develop metro and subway. So priority plans, we have 255 routes and hubs from small to gigantic and transport, transfer hubs that would handle hundreds of thousands passengers um, traffic daily. And as another important then, like you say, we base manually for the last 2.5 years checked all the uh, urban like uh, planning decisions uh, in the city and all plans of urban development and, and, and layouts. And as a result, we were forced to cancel 25 million square meters of, of different urban solutions. And it was not an easy decision. And first, it was done for the central part of the city. We uh, rejected uh, demolition of 250 historical buildings where all the documents were issued already for demolition. And, and we decided we'll not build them um, uh, state in the center, and not, but it will build in industrial zones and outskirts. And for 20, 25 million square meters, we rejected the urban planning decision, but for 70 million in new uh, territories, and, and new places, we decided about construction. And annually this year, we plan to trans 8.5 million square meters of real estate. If you see on the schedule uh, from the crisis of 2009, we had a drop then to 2010, then from 10, in spite of all these transformations and change, and, uh, we're doing manually for urban development. And you will see that we have a stable growth on all indicators for real estate and and investment, and we think that for this trend, positive trend to be sustained, the city uh, makes a big job to simplify procedures of approvals, permits, and constructions, and right of ways, and tenders. And we plan to reduce this, uh, uh, straight, uh, straighten these procedures on uh, decision about construction two, three times, uh, and we made a system 
electronic document submission to get um, construction permit and and uh, commissioning uh, and uh, construction expertise can be obtained in electronic form now and and send by email documents to power agency uh, they will consider it i think that for further development we need to uh, raise investment both russian and international and and they on a condition to create Klein, it only is <coughs> the main uh, drivers uh, which uh, impact uh, on uh, the urban development in Moscow. Thank you. Presentation. Uh, so Moscow will have a new master plan in 2015. And the, one of the explicit goals of this plan is to move from a single, a monocentric city to a polycentric city. There is a huge amount of infrastructure investment that goes with it where transport has a major role to play. But unlike many other places, there's also an investment to bring together the social infrastructure, the schools, the hospitals, the clinics at the same time. Uh, so that's a very interesting development. And I think this is probably the first time I've heard a city government say that they've cancelled 25 million square meters of development to achieve uh, their goal of balanced growth. I, I don't think I've ever heard that before. Uh, so congratulations to you on that amazing achievement. And uh, we'll see how this uh, shapes Moscow as it grows over the next few years. So with that, uh, let me welcome Greg Clark um, uh, for his presentation. Welcome, Greg. Um, <coughs> Deputy Mayor, hello. Samila, thank you very much. Brief presentation from me. Samila was kind enough to mention that I'm working on a book on metropolitan strategic planning. It looks at 30 case studies of different places around the world that have decided to do this different kind of planning. Why is this planning different? The first thing is it's about long-term planning. The second thing is that it's about integrated planning, not just transport or land use or housing or environment or economic, it's integrated planning. The third thing is it's vision driven. It's determined by an idea about the future, not simply incremental development from the present. The fourth thing is that usually it's multiple jurisdiction, unless you have one very big city government. And then the fifth thing to say is it usually anticipates more than one political cycle and therefore it usually has the participation of political parties that are otherwise in opposition to each other. It's about a coalition for the long term, not about a competition for the short term. When do cities do metropolitan strategic planning? They tend to do it when there's either a crisis, an opportunity, or there's a growth challenge. And generally that means they face an opportunity to move from one mode to another mode, from a city center mode to an outer city mode, from a monocenter mode to a polycentric mode, from a sprawl mode to a compact city mode, from an industrial mode to a diversified economy mode, from a mode that focuses on competitiveness to one that focuses on livability, from a municipal mode to a metropolitan mode. Metropolitan strategic planning is done when cities have an opportunity to change the mode and then to create a, a longer term cycle of investment. So I'm not going to talk to you about a lot of these different case studies, but I wanted to simply say there's a real history now of metropolitan strategic planning. The Spanish cities did it after Franco. The Australian cities did it when they realized they were copying the American model of sprawl and they needed to change. European Union cities did it when EU enlargement created the possibility for metropolitan planning. Chinese cities have been doing it 
to catch up with urbanization and population growth. Japanese cities have done it to combat climate change. Latin American cities doing it now because of that very rapid urbanization we heard about this morning. And then South Asian cities, many of them are doing it to position the city after conflict. So there's good moments in the life cycle of a metropolitan city when strategic planning is really useful. It's future-oriented, it's vision-driven, and it's about organizing a whole cycle of development. Now, I want to just do a couple of case studies with you very quickly. But let me say, I think the common thing in good strategic planning is four elements, and they're all about implementation. The first one is that a good strategic plan always has some catalytic projects in it. Projects, initiatives, usually physical projects, maybe an Olympic park, maybe the relocation of an airport, maybe the creation of a second business district, maybe the emergence of a new territory. They have catalytic projects that don't just change the space they're in, but they're able to change the whole system of the city or the metropolitan area. Catalytic projects which are cross-cutting, which get buy-in from citizens, demonstrate visible change, produce uh, capital from various sources, and are, uh, have many multipliers. The second thing that good strategic planning has is clear leadership and governance, so that there is authority to change the system of other kinds of planning which are usually very fragmented. Strategic planning has the effect of bringing together the other kinds of planning to make them more coherent. The third thing is financing. Most strategic planning is about changing land uses so that more value can be created and good strategic planning captures the value that's created and recycles it, creating a new cycle of investment at a higher rate. In other words, strategic planning changes the balance sheet of the city and how it works. And lastly, good strategic planning creates new institutions. Institutions for infrastructure, institutions for urban development, institutions for planning, like the ones that Andy and Rashid talked about. Good strategic planning, catalytic projects, leadership and governments, governance, new forms of financing, and new institutions. In Singapore, where strategic planning has been used to achieve 100 years development in 45, 50 years, they have a clear model of how to do this, which combines quality of life, competitive economy, and sustainable environment with integrated planning and strong urban governance. We learned a lot from them. Strategy-led government, ruthless pursuit of quality of life, a long-term approach over three or four cycles, but taking one cycle at a time, focus on livability, education, health, housing, transport, and then combining planning with urban governance. That's been very important. In Hong Kong and the greater Pearl River Delta, the catalytic project was the movement of the airport from Hong Kong Island to a purpose-built island. This enabled Hong Kong to develop, here we are, a new regional allocation of land uses to different industries with a new infrastructure platform to underpin them and therefore to build from what was a city separated from its region a completely new planned Greater Pearl River Delta region. And from Hong Kong, the lessons were incentives for intermunicipal cooperation, a strong role for the national government, regional business engagement, infrastructure and spatial economics, and a regional logic to new land uses and economic development. Andy's already described London, and of course the great catalytic project here was the Olympics, and Andy showed how the Olympics was able to open up the regeneration potential of London uh, to the north and to the east. Very important. We won't go through all of this, but this is really London's strategic plan in a graphic. What are the lessons from London? A clear policy framework, the use of transport to shape regional development, 
but transport, as Andy was saying, on its own is not enough. A clear investment prospectus to get the private sector involved in a negotiated way. Strong spatial focus on the areas that would have the biggest change, like the Olympic Park, and then the accelerated planning tools. Lastly, let's just look at New York. Two kinds of strategic planning in New York at the municipal level and at the metropolitan level. At the municipal level, a strong focus on adding livability to New York's mix. Plan NYC was about saying New York is already one of the most competitive cities in the world. Let's also make it livable and green. Let's make it a place people really want to be. And so the combination of that with the regional planning, the metropolitan approach, has led to clearer long-range thinking, stronger engagement of civic leaders in an influencing and advocacy role, several catalytic projects, particularly public space, the reclamation of public space and the greening of infrastructure, strong focus on the risk return profile of the big projects to get the private sector involved, and then building the case for investment over time. So what I wanted to say to you simply is I think metropolitan strategic planning is the tool for metropolitan areas that want to change their mode create a new cycle of development, growth, and investment, and achieve something that cities don't always get, which is an integrated set of plans, rather than a disparate set of plans being managed and implemented by multiple parties. It's a governance tool as well as a planning tool. It's an investment tool as well as a land tool. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. It was very timely after three case studies to get an overview and distillation of lessons from 30 cities. And I think uh, Greg, as always, did a very good summary of his own presentation. But I would like to highlight two points that haven't been made that clearly before. Uh, the idea of a catalytic project. All cities tend to have them, but they don't necessarily phrase them uh, as catalytic and or don't, uh, they're not seen as part of a strategic plan. So that's a very important contribution there. And the second idea that it's not just about uh, changing land use to create value, but also to capture value, uh, which is very difficult to do and only very few cities have managed to create public value from um, uh, land use transformation. Usually it becomes a private gain as opposed to a public gain. Um, unless it's very well managed. So with that, uh, uh, we've had the four presentations. We'd like to open it up for questions. Uh, we'll take a few questions at a time and uh, have the uh, speakers respond to them. Uh, yes, over there. Good afternoon, my name is Olga Sarapolo. I'm from Bashkortostan, uh, the city of Ufa. Well, definitely the development of urban, uh, strategic urban development uh, 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 strategic documents uh, to be developed, uh, the strategy and the vision of a city, certainly it's a, a growth point with the majority of many Russian cities development. Uh, in particular, in our city in Ufa, Bashkortostan, uh, our uh, city administration works a lot in this area. However, uh, uh, in the course of it, uh, we encountered one uh, uh, issue. It's a question to all speakers. Uh, which agency, which government body uh, would uh, exercise control and monitor, uh, who have oversight uh, all uh, the conformity of the projects and development uh, with conformity with, with a vision, a strategic vision? Uh, clearly, this uh, institution uh, well uh, should be a high authority in order to, uh, 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 to count uh, various uh, lobbying efforts by uh, various stakeholders. Well, the person knowledgeable about uh, Russian uh, urban development legislation, uh, I can say uh, that control and oversight of city development uh, is exercised uh, through the master plan, which is uh, approved by all residents. Uh, if the residents disagree, then, then uh, on approval of this uh, master plan, they are supposed uh, to deliver their disagreement. It's uh, provided in uh, current law. Your question is a very important one about what kind of institutions uh, should control the strategic planning exercise. Mr. Marat gave his response from a Russian angle, but uh, Rashid had uh, expressed something about what was the tension there. And uh, I'm sure Andy and others can comment as well. So Rashid. 
thank you. I think that uh, we've developed this concept of, of the nerve center. Uh, after several years of practice in the provincial government, which is headed by the premier or the governor, if you like, uh, there was a sense that that uh, when um, when the, you know control over over some of these strategic projects were decentralised to departments, it actually caused a problem. So. What, uh, what's now happening is that we're actually moving towards a greater level of centralization. So the commission that I head up, the, the planning commission is responsible for the formulation and development uh, of the plan. And there's another division that actually oversees, uh, there's a kind of a, a meta project manager, well, project oversight uh, group that, uh, that basically oversees things. So uh, that's the kind of model that, uh, that we've been moving to. In the cities, there's also a similar move towards, like in the city of Johannesburg, uh, in the office of the mayor, yeah, there's also uh, that kind of capacity which actually being 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 created to to oversee projects and ensure that uh, basically conflicts and issues are, are mediated effectively. Thank you, Rashid. Andy, do you want to? Um, well, so many places a different context. I mean, the London context. The story that I was trying to to show was that the importance of their. Um, of there having been a very strong vision. And it goes to sort of Greg's point, which is starting out from the fact that there was a real consensus about, uh, about the future of London and, again, the importance of London within the overall uh, United Kingdom, given how much it, of economic value it produces and how much of the population lives uh, in London and the surrounding area. So going back 40 years, um, I think what was very powerful is that consensus of a vision. That then finds its way into many different mechanisms, legal mechanisms, planning mechanisms, down to delivery as in the Olympic Park. But all of those were derived from having a clear sense about what the future of the city is, the future of the region is, and where its growth should go. Otherwise, that could shift every few years. Legislation can change. Lots of things can change within the UK context. But that vision has remained uh, very, very consistent. Uh, to Greg's point about leadership, it's gone through different political parties, different ups and downs of the economy, and it was always trying to find a new opportunity. The Olympics just happened to be a great opportunity to implement a, a really a large-scale infrastructure project. Um, but there may be the next opportunity, and the government is now investing in a huge transport infrastructure called Crossrail to connect east and west of the city, 19 billion pounds, Olympics was 9 billion pounds, because of that consistency of vision. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, other questions? Yes. Um, there, and then go first, and then we'll take a few questions at the same time. Just go ahead. Yes. <coughs> Добрый день. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm from the Committee for Civil Rights. Uh, my question is uh, to Marat Hosnolen and uh, to other experts. Uh, and my first question. We say it says that uh, Moscow is being built quite well, as agreed with the residents. Uh, however, however, uh, currently we move uh, this way. Tomorrow, probably, a command is given, go another way. And a third way, maybe tomorrow, I can tell you for sure that uh, earlier, earlier, uh, micro districts uh, used to be built uh, one way, and now uh, it, uh, an idea has fallen upon our heads uh, that Moscow will be built by quarters, uh, as once upon a time in the past. Uh, uh, suddenly, we made a decision here uh, to make highways uh, longitudinal up uh, to highways, and we begin to build them, although all residents around are against uh, public hearings uh, on the master plan. Uh, Mr. Mr. Marat, Mr. Marat, we don't know. They were held, you know, following the same principles presently, uh, with a lot of falsification. And uh, along the, uh, about the highways uh, and uh, uh, land delineation, uh, uh, you know, fake signatures are made, are gathered from dead people. I am responsible for each my word. Everything goes against law here. Uh, land delineation, which is being uh, done right now, it's in effect uh, like a seizure of property from uh, residents, from citizens. Uh, uh, there were uh, areas uh, when uh, prior, prior to construction, prior to every custom facility, and areas are located for construction. And it was it were many scandalous things. Well, so a land plot is allocated, and if it has not been changed, it's supposed to be remain as it is. Currently, people are cheated, and they convinced even the leadership that land land is not for people. Urban land is not for people. So my question is, 
You, you, you disagree. You promised us four times to receive us, to discuss in peace all the issues. Four times you declined. You declined yeah, from this talk. So I have to speak up it right now here. And the last point, what I promised, it's a question to everybody. Please tell me. Uh, longitudinal highways or flyovers in such cities as Moscow, is it good or bad? You know, the uh, shallow uh, subway, is it good? Uh, which later, uh, well, 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 sometimes uh, you have to uh, to uh, plunge under the highway and decades are taken to build uh, the, for this highway. There is no benefit received there. And for our generation and for future generation, it's a, 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 it's a fuse bomb, uh, slow fuse, time bomb. Uh, uh. So please, professional opinion on this. I'd like to explain that Anatoly Brown is a professional oppositioner of uh, government policy. So he, having taken advantage of this representation, he came to, to say how we do everything bad. And I'll explain all city development programs. And I shown in my last presentation, they are available uh, as a program of city development approved for three, five, and uh, eight years uh, I had. This is for all decisions that we make in the city according to urban uh, legislation we make with public hearing. In public hearing, there are different opinions. And we make decisions uh, where the majority of city people support this point of view. But according to sociological polls in Moscow, 62 uh, percent support construction of roads, but those city dwellers that uh, that these roads uh, around them, they are against. Now, regarding longitudinal and uh, flyover highways, not to waste time of colleagues, I'm uh, ready to invite you. And our specialists will uh, provide you information in detail and will tell you what we do. No microphone. This has not been considered, reviewed. These proposals were not reviewed. Uh -huh. Thank you. As it's an international forum, I think it's better to speak in English. I'm uh, Andriyeva Alexandra. I'm a local deputy of uh, Region Lefortovo in Moscow. And uh, what I wanted to say, that's uh, what said Mr. Reckant, it's absolutely true. Nearly all public hearings in Moscow are falsificated. I can give uh, examples in my area, in other areas, uh, but my question concerns not... Uh, in Moscow there are several hundred uh, groups which are against buildings. Nearly every building project in Moscow is uh, furiously... Uh, people are furiously against nearly all uh, new building in Moscow. Uh, and uh, the most important from my point of view is that Moscow is a very ancient city. And in Moscow, still, there is no law protecting historical buildings. For example, two weeks ago, uh, a group of Moscow um, bureaucrats Leaded by Mr. Husnulin, decided to destroy several uh, several dozens of pre-revolutional buildings, including uh, six pre-revolutional buildings of Sretensky Monastery. Mr. Husnulin says that he can uh, do nothing with it because there are laws, and uh, builders do not work against law. The problem is not easily solved, but very easily solved. First, so I represent a group of Moscow local deputies. Is there a question? Yes, it's a qu th there is a question. And people who want to ask, uh, is Moscow uh, media can follow people's wishings and have a moratorium, can he forbid uh, destroying of buildings older than 1956. And second question is, 
can Moscow measure take a, a law that is already ready that uh, forbids uh, over reconstructing of Moscow and ask Moscow local Duma, uh, uh, Moscow Duma to take it? The law is ready. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And I th the question is uh, for Mr. Husnulin. I'm ready to answer. First of all, I uh, don't 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 say um, uh, wrong things here. If you consider that in public hearings the law was uh, violated, go to court. If what the court make decision, and if you go to court and then the court does not support your point of view, then 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 we sue you for for slander because you make a public. Uh, um, announcement about falsification and, and breach of, of, of law. This meeting is not a place of political debates. It's just for discussion of urban planning development of the city. And these uh, problems exist everywhere. This is first thing. Second, for the last three years, Mr. Sabianin canceled demolition of 200 historical monuments and for which all permits were issued for demolition. And we canceled this decision, and we pay to investors for their losses incurred. And so, really, for the the last commission, five small buildings that are not monuments actually, where where collegiately by the majority decision was made, and by commission specially authorized with what decision was made uh, to demolish and in order to build in Moscow new monastery. Uh, for a new temple, and we had 2,000 applications of uh, believe to request uh, construction of this temple. So please don't use this uh, place for your self uh, PR. And uh, I want to explain to my colleagues who guests here in September next year we have elections to municipal. Um, Deputies, so Moscow, Moscow uh, City Duma, so many opposition parties use this platform for their self promotion. So I suggest we discuss here professional issues and don't do politics here. Ask Greg and Anne Lee to weigh in on this discussion because this is not the first city in which there is opposition to. Uh, demolition of older buildings and how to make way for new growth and development. Uh, because many cities uh, run up against a constraint. The cities are growing, the older fabric is insufficient to uh, accommodate that growth. And I know that those debates have happened in New York and I'm sure they've happened in London. So if I may ask the other experts on this panel to say something on a professional front on how to handle uh, this issue. Uh, well, I would start by saying that, um, you know, there's a, there's a phrase in English which is, you can't make an omelette if you don't break eggs. And in a city that has to change mode in the way I was describing, from sprawl to compact, from monocentric to polycentric, from industrial to services, from a city that's competitive to becoming a city that's livable, you do have to manage the reallocation of land uses in an intelligent way. And that means that you do have to have processes of land use change, and that means that not all the buildings will survive these processes of change. Now, every country has its different system for deciding how to do this, but in most countries where there's a mature system, they have a process of deciding which of the many, many buildings they will protect, and to find a way to protect, to validate, and to reuse some of the buildings, and to say goodbye to the others. So it's very important to have a clear idea about what is essential and what is necessary. Uh, there is a perception that in China, for example, historic preservation was not strong enough. There's a perception that in India, historic preservation has been too strong. So getting the balance right is not easy. There will be a Russian solution. There'll be a Moscow solution. It will not involve demolition of all of the historic buildings. It will not involve preservation of all of the historic buildings. It will involve a balance where you can create 
a sustainable use of the historic buildings that you retain in the future. That's the key thing. Well, I, I think Greg. No, I think Greg did a very good summary. I think it goes also to the importance of. Uh, I think the deputy is presenting the new master plan that's being developed because the master plan and in Greg's presentation uh, also when summarizing the importance of strategic metropolitan planning and master planning is in a city that has a lot of growth where you're going to have to strike this balance and there are a lot of pressures. You're trying to find those new areas, which is why this notion of and this conference of the development of the periphery is finding new centers to relieve some of that pressure that's on historic districts uh, so that that growth can occur and you can strike that balance. But there is, oh, there's always going to be change. I mean, cities are always going to transform. So, you know, you're trying to relieve pressure on the one hand and then in the individual context, balance it through the right processes and really defining, you know, what is important to save and what frankly needs to go to make way for change and that can be done in the right, uh, the right context. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sergei Prapechka, Boston Consulting Group. I'd like to ask a question, um, bringing us back to the uh, topic of this of this whole session about the strategic planning. So uh, there is a nice metaphor that I like about the urban planning. It, it says uh, that the cities are not islands. Cities are part of agglomeration. Cities are part of the, especially capital cities of the bigger region. Capital cities are an essential part of the whole country. But then when we think about strategic planning, so where does, where does it start? Does it start at the national level, especially thinking about capital city? Or does it start at the, from within, from the city itself? Thank you. Should we take another, Should we take another one or two questions? Yes. Please. OK, we'll just go take all four. One, two, and three. Go ahead. Good afternoon. A question is, first to Marat Zanch, uh, uh, how you confident you feel um, the budget of Moscow when implementing the uh, development of Troyes Nova Moskovska uh, district, and and if there is an opinion of others, also would be interesting to hear. I will add, sorry, you expecting any federal support or participation of other organizations? At Korea Strategy Partners Group, question is the following. First, colleagues, remember, as Mr. Hasinur has a very responsible and, and uh, difficult job, and the uh, question is, in Moscow, there was a, a competition for concept of big Moscow development. Which ideas from this uh, competition were taken into the new master plan? Do you work with the teams who won this um, competition? And another question, uh, with unstable economic situation in the world, globally, and in Russia, and with the Moscow budget, do you have plan B? According to, uh, regarding your plans for further development. My name is uh, Nikolai, General Director of the company Narco. As a citizen of Moscow region, I want to see how Moscow region, as how within the small concrete uh, circle road, will be included in master plan of 2015 good, because consider Moscow separately of, of the region. Uh, as uh, not right, Poly cannot be created in a polycentric city. What about Karolyov, Matishi, and other cities would be included into this plan? How to organize uh, with experience of other cities like Toronto, interaction between the city and uh, all, uh, munis local mun municipalities? I will start from the last question. We organize interaction of Moscow region to create a unified master plan. We have weekly meetings, and you are right, making separate plans for Moscow and Moscow region is not, is not practical. Regarding budget, really large-scale objectives, 
Moscow to develop new territory requires significant financial resources. That's why we split this, all this work for stages. First, we develop territories the adjacent to the city, and, and then we created five uh, urban zones and, and, and counted in money for the first priority actions that would be in the less in the next two three years because they need to be designed uh, tendering it and construction and start construct for the next three years we plan for each facility to be in the in the in the in the in a special state government um, uh, program so it is described and supported with funds financial resources we think we will resolve second we seriously dealing with Attracting uh, out of budget uh, sources of financing uh, of budget, certain lines of subway are, are planned to be prepared for financing with uh, foreign capital, railroads, toll roads, uh, toll crossings. So we we prepare some um, other option to engage uh, off budget funds regarding uh, what Moscow would be the center. The, uh, Moscow would always be. Uh, Circle Center, uh, Moscow, and the capital city, and and, and concentrate uh, capital and and develop and inf influence uh, territories next to it. So, so this uh, will stay like this. Question about the capital cities and capital city regions and the relationship of major cities with national governments. It's a very big issue, not only in Russia. Um, in every big city around the world, at the moment, you have a kind of contested space between the role of the globalizing city that is becoming increasingly the hub for business, for population growth, for transactions, for visitors, and the nation state, which is in a sense the management model that we've inherited from the previous cycles. So economically, most national governments are now realizing they need at least one globally successful city, if not more than one, and that that globally successful city, in order to change mode, to become a successful world city, is going to need a lot of investment. On the other hand, they realize that the fiscal systems that they have take money from the big city and put it into the smaller cities and the less advantaged regions. And on the other hand, at the national level, there is not much political tolerance for uneven development, where the capital city gets richer and richer and the other places get poorer and poorer. So there is a big problem here that is faced not just in Moscow, but in London, in New York, in Hauteng, it's faced in Sydney, in Australia, it's faced in Mumbai, it's faced in Beijing and Shanghai. It's the problem of the globalizing city within the nation state. Very big problem. And the only way that uh, cities are making sense of this is to become intelligent and, ta and uh, tactical. So one reason why the capital cities like London and like Tokyo and uh, like uh, uh, um, uh, Gauteng region and like Moscow are hosting the Olympics and the World Cup and the global events is because it's a way to get not just the national government to invest money, but also the people from outside the city to focus some attention on the importance of having a capital. That's one tactic. But another tactic is to get much more deeply into what I would call the system of cities conversation, where we begin to understand what are the real economic relationships between the capital city and the other places. And that tends to mean focusing more on specialization in the whole network of cities so that they can complement each other. One last point, of course, the same conversation happens between the capital city and the region around it. And increasingly, the Metropolitan Strategic Planning Tool is one of the tools that can be used to help a city and a region around a city begin to build a common agenda. And that is very important because it's never the case that all of the growth 
happens within the city. Some of the growth happens in the region. The question for the region is whether that growth is planned or unplanned, managed or unmanaged. Thank you, Greg. Uh, with that, I think we are... Uh, we are almost out of time, so I'll take just a couple of minutes to highlight some, uh, some of the points that we discussed in this session. This was about strategic planning, and one of the key things that comes out of this is a strategic plan is a long-term exercise. In London, it took about 40 years, um, and um, it's a point that Greg uh, emphasized, and the new uh, Hauteng plan looks to 2055 and so forth. So it's a long-term plan. It's not a short-term plan. And one of the key things that all speakers spoke about is a vision. So in London, it was about moving east as uh, growth came into the uh, city. Uh, in Huateng, uh, it's about having four pillars of a strategy and moving on them simultaneously. So it's not just about growth of the region, but of inclusive growth of the region, for example. And in Moscow, it's about rebalancing where people live and where they work, and to move from a monocentric city to a polycentric city. So these are examples of the visions that the presenters uh, brought forth. Uh, a key piece uh, of how to implement this uh, whole strategy uh, came through in a few ideas. One, of, one was the idea of a catalytic project that Greg brought forth, of which Olympics is an example. But another set of uh, investments that are required to make this, uh, to implement these strategic plans are infrastructure. And we heard a lot about transport infrastructure, both in this session and in the plenary session this morning, but also about social infrastructure to accommodate growth. Again, not just uh, metros and highways and corridors for transport, but also schools and clinics and hospitals. And the final point that comes through is what is the governance mechanism that will deliver on this strategic planning? And there are different modes of doing this. One of the examples was the establishment of a new institution in London for some part of London, which is East London, which is the London Legacy uh, Agency. Similarly, the Hua Teng uh, Planning Commission is one such commission that looks at a broader area. And then as the question and answer se session showed, uh, people are still seeking answers as to what would be the right governance mechanism in different settings. And the answer is it has to be tailored to your setting, but you certainly need a governance framework to implement that strategic plan. Otherwise, like the master plans of 20 or 30 years ago, they'll just sit on your shelves and that won't be such a great idea. So with that, thank you very much for your participation and a big thanks to this excellent panel of panelists. Thank you. Thank you for coming.